uh, we have with us today uh, group ceo mr jp chalasani uh, having more than uh, four decades of experience in power and fra and worked across companies including reliance punchlight and tpc uh, we also have with us uh, mr himanshu modi having more than two decades of experience across mna corporate strategy and various uh, finance functions uh, he is working as a group cfo and uh, i can now quickly read the disclaimer and then head it over to uh, mrs amisha bora our chairperson uh, uh, ma'am i'll just quickly read the disclaimer so during this uh, webinar the company management might uh, make certain statements which reflect uh, their outlook for the future or which could be construed as forward looking statement these statements are uh, based on the management's current expectations and are associated with uncertainty and risk as uh, uh, fully detailed uh, in the company's annual report which may cause an uh, the uh, actual results to differ hence these statements must be reviewed in conjunction with the risk that the company faces please note that this conference is being recorded now uh, uh, after the uh, brief uh, chat session we'll move to q and i'll hand it over to mrs amisha vora for the q and a session with the management Welcome, Mr. Chelsani and uh, Himanshu. Thank you so much for your time. You. I would definitely like to add here that Mr. Chelsani, as most of us who have been uh, in the markets for a long time, know that he has to his credit excellent execution track record across infrastructure segment. But beyond that, he has to his credit starting things from ground zero and really making it big. And uh, so this is going to be a very interesting phase for you also uh, mm -hmm. when you will be participating in this renewable story. And for us also, as you will be leading the charge as to, I was just telling Manshu, the stock is almost more than 22 bagger, but still it is the opportunity size is also very big. So what do we see from here? To start with, of course, I would like to understand that what is it that after a decade of troubleshooting, struggle, and so on, what really led to this sharp turnaround, both from the industry perspective and overall environment, and internally from the company perspective. If you can just spend a little time explaining that, that'll be very useful. Yeah, I, I thanks for the introduction. I don't know how much I deserve it, but fine, send them thanks. I don't know where to start the, the obviously most of you know about the history of the company. Um, pioneer in the sector in India, so Tulsi Bhai thought about wind in India much before anybody actually thought about it. Um, we did well here. Then uh, that point of time, the sector was mostly on the policy props, okay, whether you had an accelerated depreciation or uh, uh, you had various other benefits because of which it was uh, happening. Uh, doing well, then he saw an opportunity outside India as well. So therefore, we uh, both in terms of uh, supply of machines as well as also he thought that you know the manufacturing should not become a constraint those days gearbox was a constraint for how much capacity can you do more. so uh, there were some acquisitions happened outside india whether it's uh, hansen or in terms of re power plus also the huge expansion outside india at one point of time we were supplying more outside india than india everything right. was going fine but uh, the once the uh, financial meltdown happened that point of time, the the obviously debt got mounted and uh, couldn't pay back the debt because debt was taken for these acquisitions. So various things happened. Then we led to a default. It led to a restructuring and everything. But the second life came in in FI uh, in sometime in 2015, where we had a large equity inflow coming in from, uh, from Mr. Dilip Sanju and family. So. Uh, that led to a revival because also FY17 was the last year of feed-in tariff system in India. So they, there was mm. no competition. And also we had that year the what is called the generation-based incentive, GBI, 50 paisa per unit. 
So that year was the best year for the country till date. So as a country, we did 5.5 gigawatts in that particular year. Mm -hmm. And we did a record 1.8 gigawatts, 1789 to be precise. In, in that, so that was in fact my first year in uh, Sujilwan. Everything was going fine, but suddenly then uh, we changed the gears and uh, government of India came up with this competitive bidding guidelines in February 2017. Uh, then the transition from bidding tariff system to the bidding took quite some time. There were mm. no opportunities available in the market at that point. Mm. Uh, well, the when 5.5 uh, gigawatts we did in FI 17, the FI 16, uh, FI 18, whole country did one, we did 1.8 gigawatts. In mm. FI 18, the whole country did 1.5 gigawatts. Okay. Mm. And that system continued for some time because opportunities for the bidding were limited. And when the opportunities came, I'm first talking about external segment, what happened? The opportunities Correct. came because there were the limited opportunities. Uh, there was, like it happened in most of the infrastructure se segment in India, people wanted to just grab the projects first. Okay. People grabbed the projects, tariffs were low, unremunerative tariffs, then there was a pressure on uh, OEMs to reduce their prices. So that was a crisis, what was happening externally. The market was very, very low. Uh, at that point of time, internally, we had an issue with respect to our large fixed cost. Our break-even point at that point of time used to be 1,500 to 1,600 megawatts. Correct. And whole country was doing 1,500 megawatts. Our break-even is what even if I get 50% market, mm. it's not going to help us. Mm. And second was the uh, huge amount of debt on the balance sheet and where we were paying almost 100 crores per month as interest. So obviously, whatever we were selling, whatever revenue we get, we are only using for debt service. Correct. So uh, we carried on for a couple of years, but then, but then again, we defaulted in FI19. Correct. So that led to a, one route of uh, restructuring again, then restructuring to, uh, without the restructuring is not working, lost number of lenders, then we went for refinancing with REC, uh, with a reduced debt, sustainable debt. Then we did this equity infusion in terms of rights and VAT, so debt went away. So detailed way, mm -hmm. what, um, how we had done it, Imanshu can also explain. But then one fundamental reason why we were not performing was the debt, which is today is completely gone away. Balance sheet is completely cleaned up in this service. We paid off the entire debt, so we are no mm -hmm. debt. In fact, we started, uh, uh, we have a positive cash in the balance sheet. Second point was the, we also wanted that, you know, we can't have this uh, you know, affected to the vagaries of the business cycle. We should reduce our costs, <clears throat> make the organization lean, and make it more of a variable cost because when there are volumes, the cost can go up, but otherwise it can't go up. We can't have a fixed cost. In 2019 itself, we worked that point of time when the, the company was not doing well. We thought at least let's do the internal cleanup. We reduced our break-even point from 1,500 to 600 megawatt to 600 megawatt today. Wow. As long as we do 600 megawatt, our WTC division has the break-even point. That's a and, big achievement. Uh, so therefore, today, if you look at it, the, the two points which actually killed us was our high fixed cost and the high debt. Both, both the fundamental issues for which we were not performing got removed. Okay? So the, those are the two things which are helping us. And the third is the, uh, in the meantime, externally, the market shifted from policy props to self-sustaining model because the tariffs have significantly come down. The wind in the feed-in tariff system used to be 480, 495 rupees, the regulatory tariff is now has come down to, let's say, 340, 350 sort of a range. The, in fact, it went down as low as 246, 250, which was not sustainable anyway. So, uh, and then the, when you look at the wind with the solar hybrid or FDRE beats, round the clock beats, when you take it, uh, the tariffs are now become more or less comparable to the fossil fuel based plants, except for the large mine moth based coal plants, because I still have the, the partiality towards those plants because they produce the cheapest power for India. Other than that, just become, so therefore, it is now commercially become viable. So the, therefore, as long as there is a demand growth, because we're growing economy, the GDP to city demand is relative is 0.95. So therefore, as long as the GDP is growing, power demand will grow. And therefore, and then you're sustainable on the tariff wise, therefore there's a demand. In fact, to substantiate this, so the CE has done a study for year 2030, 
what they done the yeah. study is for the all four independent reasons they done a study for 8760 hours came up with saying that uh, the overall demand would be about 775 megawatts gigawatts of demand then they went mm. and uh, did a study that you know if you want to meet this demand what is the lowest, lowest cost option which they came up Correct. with the wind required is 100 gigawatts so 40 by 100 gigawatts would give you the trajectory of the grid connected one but much bigger thing what is happening today is not that more exciting thing what's happening is in the commercial industry segment cnda segment what we call most of the large industries <coughs> are switching from the fossil fuel based cpps to renewable based CPPs or creating a new renewable based CPPs for a simple reason that one, it gives them a tariff arbitrage because coal available for captive power plants is much expensive because they need to get the coal on e auction basis. Okay? And the gas based plants, you know, what is the gas price in India? So they mm. renewable tariff arbitrage. And on mm. top of it, also for them to sell their product outside of mm. India, so to make it green, export it. So also that you need to have green. So that segment is growing. In fact, today, 50, almost 50% 50 of our the order book today is coming from that segment, not coming from the bid PPS, not coming from the distribution company PPS. So I think the, the reason why we're doing well, mm. internally fundamentals got fixed. Externally, you're seeing sectoral tailwinds, at least for the next six to seven years, there's a clear visibility of growth in the sector. And then we... And people still believe that even we have a financial problems, people know that our product is very reliable. That's the reason when we brought our three megawatt turbine, so there's a huge response. So I think these are all the things which are, in our opinion, are making uh, uh, you know people to believe that we will go ahead and perform. Maybe you can highlight uh, about the uh, order book, book prospects, and you already highlighted uh, uh, how the uh, scenarios have changed, and there are a lot a uh, lot of talk about the reverse auction being scrapped and there is RPO policy. So anything you would like to highlight uh, uh, which uh, will bring uh, whatever we spoke about, the government is targeting 10 gigawatt each year. So uh, what prospects we can see uh, in the coming years? Yep. See, one is that fundamentally depends uh, dependence on government support has significantly come down now. While we do need the government support in terms of coming up with the bits and various aspects, because 50% of the capacity is coming from the CNDA segment, which has nothing to do with the government sort of support, except for that uh, one single issue of the on CTU, you have this transmission charges available till June 2025, which helps even the CNDA segment so for interstate transfer power. Mm -hmm. On the government side, uh, the, the obviously there is a good trajectory of for bits what they projected. <coughs> So, which are coming up, but then <clears throat> the whether it is a pure wind or the hybrid or FDRE, in every single case, the wind quotient will be there. Uh, as we speak today, there are 15 gigawatts of uh, bits out in the market. In that 15 gigawatts, about 9.5 gigawatts is FDRE bits, fixed dispatch renewable energy, which needs a huge amount of uh, wind portion. And there's about 2.7 gigawatts of wind bits in that 15 gigawatt bits, which are out there in the market. So therefore, from the bid perspective, there is a huge potential available there. And then from the CNA segment, there is continue to be a potential. Right. So, so uh, CNA would be how much, uh, uh, as you said, it's a non-government opportunity. And uh, for, from government side, we are aware that uh, government is talking about 10 gigawatt each year. Uh, so will CNA be the different buy of opportunity? And uh, now with respect to orders, so we are seeing from government uh, largely will be the utility scale. And uh, so wanted to understand, is CNI a better margin business or what is the potential of CNI? As I can see, there's a significant contribution from CNI in your order book and we are expecting uh, uh, more. So just if you could highlight on that side. Yeah, CNI arbitrage is their uh, either uh, the power what they're generating today from fossil fuel based captive plants or they, they're taking from the grid today. They don't have a captive. That's all it is. That is what is the, the benchmark price when they compare with renewable energy, the power. So the uh, CNA segment is, uh, 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 we feel that you know we are closer to that segment and why we are order book is more is uh, uh, for the CNA customers, the power is just input to the main business. 
that is not their main business. You know, they are either into steel or the cement or any other thing, refinery. Power is not their main business. So for them, what is most important is that there is somebody who supplies uh, reliable equipment and operate that for the life of the plan so that they get power, reliable power supply. So we being an Indian company, being in India with a strong product and then offering the OMS services for the rest of the life of the plant would become a sort of a, we become automatically a, a favored customer, favored, favored supplier for CNA segment. That's our advantage in terms of CNA. That's the reason you see 50% of our order book coming from CNA segment. The reason is that we're Indian company, we are here, our product is... So that is the advantage of CNA segment. And uh, the, yeah. in, in the bid PPS, uh, there are two types of IPPs, mm -hmm. which are uh, the uh, longer term utility players, like whether you call it as SEMCOP or the Torrent or uh, APRAVA, which is CLP. Um, they are they look at the longer tenure. They look at the life cycle cost of uh, things because we also offer the OMS uh, service. So we we are actually their the repeat suppliers. Multiple times we keep supplying into that. That's our uh, thing. And also uh, the other thing for us is that every single turbine we sell, we also sign the service contract. If somebody is at this stage, our policy is that if somebody is not willing to sign service contract, they want to do their own service, we don't sell the turbines today. So there could be some potential clients, so but who have an ambition of doing their own service business, there we don't supply the turbines. We just supply to the turbines for people who are willing to sign a service contract for us. So every single turbine we sell today, we are not just getting the turbine supply business, we are also getting the lifetime service contract for us. That's a model what we operate on. But I will just go on to the link that we were on and now to understand that having achieved a break even at 600, which is not heard of, I met you know, Suzlon as a management n number of time, and it was always 1400, 1500 was a max that we could, and it is now one third of that. And the external environment you said, where consumer and industry also, uh, commercial and industrial also, this is becoming competitive. That does it mean that for uh, commercial and industrial now, Compared to grid fossil power rates, it is the renewable and solar, which is, I mean, the wind and solar, which is competing. And if so, how does their return on uh, investments work and their costs work between these two? Because we've been seeing equally good traction in solar power also. Yeah. See, the, uh, I was talking about that. The, if you have a captive power plant today, your benchmark is current cost of generation or CNA segment. Uh, if it is a coal-based capacity, for most people, the coal is to be procured through your auction. Normally, for captives, you don't get the fuel supply agreements. <clears throat> Unless you're selling it to the utility, you don't get FSA. No, you need to do a uh, your auction. So the coal cost is higher. So obviously, your cost of generation is higher there. Uh, if it is a gas-based, then all of us know that we don't need to talk about, you know, gas is so expensive today. Um, so therefore, clearly they have an arbitrage compared to uh, the uh, the fossil fuel based captive power plant to renewable plants is one. Second is they also get an added advantage that uh, if you are powering yourself with the green, then your market for export increases. Okay? There are so many restrictions coming in Europe and other places unless you're green, unless you're green stamped, either you're not allowed or you get a premium if you're green stamped. That's one which helps. Third also is that the advantage is that if you want to attract investments into your own business, okay, uh, there's the so many ESG funds and various funds, you know, also look at your what is your carbon footprint. So therefore, everybody is now talking about carbon neutrality, you know, when you want to make net carbon uh, zero, net zero. So all these factors put together, it is both commercially and qualitatively also, it is becoming attractive for those people to switch over. And for people who do not have a captive, for them, the alternate supply, uh, the alternate cost is grid power. So therefore, they compare with the grid. And in India, we know what it is. Any which costly. Uh, in India, we know what is the industrial and commercial tariffs, uh, what stage it is. 
And there are a number of companies which is the stated policy. We just not bothered about what is my alternate cost. I just want to get only the green power. When you look at uh, companies like Amazon or Google or anyone in India, so they all are looking for a private PPS uh, where you know they want to just procure directly the green power. So there are different reasons why, uh, compared to what we were talking earlier, people need to be pushed. Like like your colleague was sometime back was talking about RPO obligations. Even today there are RPO obligations, but we don't talk much about RPO obligation now. Earlier, all of us used to talk how much is RPO obligation, are they being because that is the secondary issue today. Because the tariffs have become competitive and C and segment is there. So sector has become self-propellant rather than depending upon the policy. That's a change what has come now. Absolutely. But between solar and renewable, uh, the comparison in terms of ROI for the uh, commercial and industrial segment. Yeah, so I, I I will talk with respect to the uh, uh, my power sector knowledge. Okay. Uh, when you when you talk about the tariff, in object to in independent way, tariff doesn't make any sense. Okay. Tariff in terms of time of the generation, time of consumption makes a big difference, time of the day. Okay. So you need today there is a perception that solar is cheaper versus wind. Right? First of all, we don't agree that solar versus wind, it is solar and wind, if you want to meet, because that's how. Hybrid only will work. Hybrid plus storage is what moving it. But the thing, if you say, is that one way to compare is that when solar generation happens, what is the demand? What is the price in the exchange? Okay, that's that's a mm -hmm. price. Versus when when wind generates, what is the price in the exchange? That shows the demand. If you see that, it will show that you know wind is not expensive at all compared to solar, because today we don't have the time of the day tariffs in the country. And we don't know what are the tariffs at these different points of time. Mm. Because the availability during the peak period is what makes a huge difference. Availability during peak seasons makes a difference. So uh, therefore, that question, leaving aside that question, I don't think people have a choice of choosing between wind or solar. Mm. They only have a choice of choosing how much wind and how much solar in the overall basket. Because uh, because you, you if you want to meet your demand profile, if you are an industry, if you are meeting for captive purpose, you are demand profile wise, you won't get from one single source. So you got to club both. So for some places it could be 50, 50, some places it could be 75, 25, depending upon where you are, what is your demand profile, your generation mm. profile has to match that. So I think uh, the today what is important for us to talk is that what is the tariff of hybrid in the country? How does it compare with alternate choices? And what is the tariff of round the clock power, like whatever you call it, FDRE power or round the clock power? Versus what is this thing, but not the wind versus solar. It doesn't make uh, any more sense on that. Okay. Except for the very yeah. small segment which say that, you know, I only want to use the day, daytime for five, six hours, then obviously you can just go and put solar and do that. But the mm. demand is very, very limited. Mm. Yeah. Like, like, that... rooftop, like like uh, residential customers. Obviously, solar Correct. is the only way. There is no wind there. Rooftop, uh, solar, whatever is to be done, is only through solar. Correct. So is there... The question probably, can I frame it like this, that what do you see is either the execution capability of wind sector based on both the availability of land, availability of turbines, whatever is the combination, what is the execution capability? You hit the How need. do I map the opportunity? You, you hit and, the need. And that too in immediate future, say you can say next three years. If you just try and explain that to us. You hit the nail. Uh, mm. the, that is actually decides how much is the capacity addition can happen in India. Yeah, right. uh, demand will be there. Supply will be there. Mm. I don't think there's an issue with respect to the demand. And there won't be a significant issue with respect to supply of turbines. Okay. The, the conversion of the supply of turbines into commissioned capacity is what is important. Okay. Uh, it's, Otherwise, because as a country, it doesn't make any difference to us. You know, it doesn't make any impact to us if I say that we have a 10 gigawatt supply capacity or 15 gigawatt supply capacity. Unless we are doing 10 gigawatts, 15 gigawatts commission capacity per year. Mm -hmm. But that's what is going to impact the country. So this capacity is coming mm -hmm. on the grid. So gap today is that execution capability. Converting the supply into commissioning is what is the issue. Uh, if you look at today, the, the reason for that is the one is EPC capabilities. Second is the grid connectivity. These are the two reasons why you're saying that you're seeing that there's a constraints in terms of uh, how much capacity can come in. If you see 
even this year with all that what we talked about so much of bit capacity available so much of this capacity available we only did about 2.6 or so in the first nine months 2.6 gigawatts and then normal expectation is not more than 3.4 3.5 gigawatts this year really so, that means uh, we are not reaching the peak we reached before not this year not this year no way so in nine months it's only 2.6 gigawatts the uh, the point is that the Earlier, when we did the 5.5 gigawatts, we need to understand the reason is that 5.5 gigawatts between Suzlan and Kamesha, we had about 70-75% of share. And both of us were doing EPC. And these were state-connected, STU-connected bits. Okay? There were no CTU-connected concept at that point of time in FI-17. There was a state PPS, state-connected, and then supplying there. So there, there was an opportunity for OEMs to go acquire land in advance and mm -hmm. get the connectivity mm -hmm. in advance. Go and offer, mm -hmm. land. I have a land, I have a connectivity and this state is giving you the PPA. So we used to get mm -hmm. the order to, to commission capacity in the same year. Mm -hmm. But now the concept is changed. Okay. CTO connectivity is completely different. Either, <clears throat> either you need to have a PPA or you need to have 50% of the land. There are various restrictions why when you get a CTO connectivity. So these complications are leading is that you start acquiring most places land only once you have a PP or you have an EPC order. Okay. And, and mm -hmm. then the only OEM which is left providing EPC services is not today. Because of these mm -hmm. constraints, these problems, the, every OEM stopped doing EPC. No other OEM does the EPC, no other large OEM. Let me let me underline that large OEM. Okay. No other large OEM does the EPC, only we are left out. And the balance is being done by obviously there are uh, the other you know, coming up today in the sector who are doing the BOP. How quickly we do this capacity building in terms of doing the land in the BOP would decide how much capacity can go up. Our expectation is that the, the this 3.5 could go up to about 6 gigawatts the next year. And that is FI25, then maybe 7, 8. And then thereafter, we really need to see that how do we cross 7, 8 gigawatts. That's a challenge for us, for, for as a country. I think that is what actually the execution capability, your question is absolutely on the spot, is that would decide what is the capacity addition, not the supplies. And that's mm -hmm. where we, we think that uh, we have advantage. Now, also, what in order to to some extent the leapfrog this uh, or to overcome this problem, we started a model where uh, mm -hmm. we a couple of state governments an agreement that you give us uh, land, identify a land boundary for X gigawatts. Okay, so we're done mm -hmm. with one gigawatt, other state for about two and a half gigawatts where we are saying that you give us a rights, exclusive rights to develop that. Mm. We are not acquiring the land at the stage, but we have the rights to develop. Nobody else can come there. Then now we are going to the different IPPs or different people who have an interest to develop players, saying that, okay, I have the developmental rights. Mm. If you have an ambition to develop one gigawatt or two gigawatt over the next two to three years, let's jointly co-develop this. So we will acquire the land for you in this area because only I can do the project. So you start putting money, we will acquire the land so that the, we do the initial legwork faster. And at some stage of the teaching the land, then you either you put, put a PPA, um, you put in a bid or you do a CNDI, we'll quickly convert that into a project. So where, because mm. the land is already available and then it's our turbines, you will do that. So that's a model which we started now in the two states, we already started the project. I think this is what moving ahead will help us to actually accelerate the commissioning of the more production commission. So how is the, you said next year India can do close to 6 gigawatt, which means almost 90% growth in the total installations or commissioning, so to say. How is that market share going to be divided? And what is the kind of order book that you already have or visibility that you all as an industry players already have? What are the new things that has to happen for us to reach this six gigawatt? Or this is already in pocket? No, you know, six gigawatt is for the country, not for Switzerland. Uh, for the country, exactly. That's what I say. For yeah, the country. Yeah, I want to clarify. <laughs> Otherwise, no, tomorrow, no, I very, very much <laughs> said... People in the market it... will say that team of Switzerland said they will do six gigawatt next No, no, no. no. <laughs> no, no <laughs> I said that it's for the yeah. uh, industry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just to clarify that, 
the yes. see, market share is a bit of a for us it's a bit of a misnomer because we, we are still having 30 percent market share at this peak okay but then this market share has a different meaning depending upon what is the total capacity okay but of the what we are working internally me and my colleagues is that if my capacity to execute is x gigawatts in a year irrespective of what is the market in the country we need to go and deliver that six gigawatts okay don't hold me to these numbers let's say that you know i have a capacity to deliver three gigawatts projects if it is six gigawatt market it is 50 percent market share if it's a 10 gigawatts market it's 30 percent market share so what we are trying to work towards is that while market share is good to measure for external people but for us let's decide what is our capacity and we should build our capability in a manner that irrespective of the market, we should be able to go and deliver this capacity. So sometimes it could be 40%, sometimes it could be 20%, no problem on this. But as long as we say that this is my capacity, I'm completely utilizing my capacity and delivering it. That's a concept on which we are working on. So what is the capacity? And do you still have that capacity in India or that China capacity was also there, which is there? Can you just give us some idea about now where the capacity is we are just in india just in india again i underline we have no capacity anywhere else outside india manufacturing capacity wise we have entire capacity in india uh, our capacity today is that uh, the if you look at the tower and nacelle there are three components in this tower nacelle and blade the tower and nacelle we can even today do about 3.5 to 4 gigawatts is but they're two different models okay so please understand that we have a two megawatt model we have a three megawatt model these two put together, we can deliver three and a half to four gigawatts. As for the blades is concerned, the two megawatts we have it, three megawatts we are ramping up. So that also we will reach in the next couple of quarters together. So we should be able to reach about three and a half to four gigawatts of capacity. That's our capacity. But then uh, one has to understand is that if you have a manufacturing capacity of four gigawatts, doesn't mean that you will deliver four gigawatts. Correct. So it depends upon the external market because this is 4 gigawatts. If you constantly load your market, your manufacturing plant, month to month, you can deliver 4 gigawatts. But your Correct. offtake is slightly skewed because of you know projects somewhere, the project is delayed, their offtake is delayed. So to that extent, you lose your capacity. Absolutely. Because there are other factors come into picture saying that, okay, one is saying that so much installed capacity I have. But then how much can we deliver depend upon year to year what is the external. Is that 70, 75 reasonable or it can reach up to 80, 85 in the current demand scenario? If if uh, we succeed in what we're doing today, like uh, the co-development activities, what we're talking about, which should become uh, um, available from, let's say, FI26 onwards, not for FI25, then this would increase, this percentage would increase because we would have worked already on the land development because basic constraint is the land. Okay. Most of the people and the connectivity. Connectivities are more and more are now becoming clearer. So as long as you have a land, you can quickly convert. So I think the we would reach a higher percentage in FI26. In FI25, it's obviously that numbers, what you're saying, could be the range, which provided there is an offtake. Correct. And how does, uh, you say you have brought down the break-even to 600 uh, megawatt. But now, in terms of, you know, from 24 to 25, as you will also grow at 70, 80% in terms of what you produce in OEM, uh, as an OEM, what kind of economies of scale do you all have in the business? It's not the, the, the economy of scale to some extent helps. But what happens is that, the, of course, I, I'll now provide the air time to human so I'm, I'm just... Man, completely capitalizing in their time, he will explain to you, is that when we say that 600 megawatt is our break-even, what happens is the moment we cross 600 megawatt, our entire margin goes towards EBITDA. Okay. So that's how the, the significantly EBITDA starts improving beyond 600 megawatt because we have recovered our entire fixed cost. So our mar in margin already takes care of our variable cost. So therefore, the whole thing, the entire margin goes towards that. You want to add on to that? Much? Yeah. So <clears throat> essentially, in the manufacturing division alone uh, today, you know, our uh, contribution margin is about uh, in the mid teens, uh, fifteen to seventeen percent, depending on the period that you take. Uh, so as JPC sir mentioned, uh, so long as we do about uh, six hundred megawatts of uh, turbine manufacturing in any given year, uh, 
our contribution margin, we will break even at the operating level. And any delta manufacturing over and above the 600 megawatts would mean that the entire contribution margin for the delta capacity will flow through through the EBITDA. That's for the manufacturing division. Of course, for the O&M division, uh, that's a uh, separate economics. Uh, 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 there, you know, we are close to about uh, forty percent uh, in operating margin, and in the next uh, two to three years, uh, OM will see a very uh, secular uh, inflationary growth on top line, because the way the OM model works is that when we did the supplies, uh, there is a three-year warranty that we provide to the equipment, and that warranty is built into the sales price. So the OM billing starts only with a three-year lag. For example, in FY25, which we are entering in another month, uh, whatever supplies we did in FY21 is what will get added to the O&M billing cycle. And historically, the supplies have been very muted for so long as a company. Therefore, over the next two to three years in the O&M top line, there will be a secular growth uh, whilst we maintain the margins on the O&M. So when we look at the consolidated uh, numbers, uh, number profiling, you know, people may see that you know there is a a dip in contribution margin on a console basis. That dip is because purely because the share of the manufacturing division in the overall pie is significantly increasing and the manufacturing has a lower contribution margin in percentage terms as compared to the O&M. But contribution margin is a na uh, name that you have coined. Financial market has few names, gross profit margin, EBITDA margin, EBIT margin. Which margin are you referring to? So I'm referring to the gross profit margin is equal to the contribution margin. Okay, understood. But which means that your EBITDA will have a uh, reasonably good economies of scale when break even is at 600 and, and if I, you do yeah. something like 1800 megawatts or uh, 2000 so, or more, yeah, the other economies of scale, uh, Amisha, we also, you know, uh, expect, you know, logical that, you know, of course, in the you look at the recent past, uh, our supply schedule with our suppliers, you know, our, whether it is uh, uh, what we pick up from our suppliers, our payment schedules with them have also been erratic. Uh, you know, now with uh, the order book visibility that we have, uh, we are also able to negotiate, uh, uh, you know, better payment terms, better unit pricing terms. Uh, over a longer duration contract with our suppliers. So, you know, logically that should also have some impact on the uh, margins. Mm, correct. So, so uh, the three components of the business uh, from renewable perspective, wind, solar, and now there is hydrogen, which we keep talking about, we keep hearing about. And I now also see people raising money for that. How do you see that fitting into your uh, entire scene? What we expect is that, uh, like we talked about uh, two segments of business. One is the utility PPA, which is coming through the bidding route. And we're talking about CNDA segment, okay, commercial. Yes. What we expect is that the CNDA segment for that captive consumption would mature and would start coming down after three years, three to four years, three years to four year horizon. So everybody would have converted, whoever wants to convert, would have converted into captive, uh, into renewable settings. Uh, our expectation is that that point of the time when the hydrogen would pick up. Today we're talking, but hydrogen really took, take will take few years before we start. And for hydrogen, 70% of the cost of hydrogen production is power cost. Huge amount of uh, renewable power is required there. So therefore, the CNDA segment, would, because that is again the CNDA segment. Okay. That is not nothing to do with the bidding and you know, those things. So therefore, that's the reason we believe that the well utility PPS would continue to be there. They will be up and down, keep happening there depending upon how much PPS they want to sign. But the CNDA segment would continue to grow and would maintain, would be there for the next, let's say, a decade or so. Because hydrogen would pick up later. It may not be today, but definitely by the time the current CNDA demand starts dipping, hydrogen would pick up. Mm, so that will uh, aid to your yeah. sustainability of growth rather. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's it has to be green hydrogen, so to say. Yeah. Hydrogen is nothing but the, see, the only change what is happening in that is the power supply. Everything remains the same. The the moment you're calling it green only purely because you're using the... Yeah, that's the only power. differentiator. Power. 
and therefore and 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 the red, actually the hydrogen project is nothing but renewable project because seventy percent of the cost is only the renewable power cost in production of hydrogen. Are there any other policy changes which can impact the uh, renewable industry or particularly the wind, which you would like to uh, address to? See, not the policies, but the one issue always would remain is the for the growth of the sector is the commercial viability of your distribution sector, which we all know. You know, this is now I finished four decades, but when I joined in 79 in NTPC and today we keep, still keep talking about commercial reforms in distribution sector. That continues to be a problem. But gradually what's happening in the last two to three years, uh, which is much more important in my view than actually the policy, is the... Uh, reforms are now picking up. If you look at the commercial, it is still not there where we would like it to be there, but you're gradually seeing it. In fact, if you see the latest report of uh, which Government of India produces rating of the distribution companies, okay, distribution utilities. They are now released a report for FI22. The, uh, the gap between the average cost of supply versus average revenue realization, which was around 92 paisa previously, has come down to 40 paisa now. Okay. So there is a big gap. Now the subsidies are getting paid to the distribution company by the government. So commercial viability still, 40 paisa gap means we're still losing money as a sector. But coming down from 92 to 40 and AT&C losses coming down to 16.5% from 22%. These are all the right indicators that commercial viability is happening. More and more mm -hmm. commercial viability happens. That is good enough for supporting the sector. That is more mm -hmm. important than the policy support. Because policy support can be temporary. Mm -hmm. But then... Sector foundations is what is most important, which is what is happening now with various initiatives what Government of India especially took up, whether it is uh, late payment such as scheme or you talk about reforms linked loans from PFC and REC, NIRIDA, whatever it is. These things are now slowly started making the way because including the state government started realizing that unless the distribution sector improves, they won't be able to develop other infrastructure sector, whether health mm. or education, because they're all their budget is going towards the power sector deficit. I think that's much more important to me rather than the policy. I don't think really policy would impact that extent now. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of which political party comes, I don't think this is not going to change now because it's a self-sustaining model now. As I said, the tariff being competitive, it has now reached this level of self-sustaining. But in hydrogen, the process will start now. Like whatever happened here, you brought mm -hmm. the economy of scale by initially providing policy support, initially providing RPO obligations. Now in the hydrogen, same cycle will start. So mm -hmm. they're now going to give exactly like RPO, they're coming up with saying that you know, what is the minimum hydrogen, green hydrogen you should consume, things like that, mm -hmm. under the Energy Conservation Act. So that cycle will start and make green hydrogen viable, like renewable power becoming viable. But not in the pure renewable sector. Yeah, we will just try and touch upon a bit on the size and scale of numbers also and the kind of uh, sales mix. So how do you see your 24 is about to end, but we will keep that as base. If we keep that as base, so 24 to 25 and 26, how do you see the sales mix changing? What kind of impact will it have on free cash generation and what kind of capex that you need to do to catch up with the demand? It's a mix of uh, two other points I'll leave it to. One point I don't think we give a significant guidance, but uh, CapEx, uh, Himansha will say. Uh, uh, Mix-wise, we can, we would continue to see this mix continue to be around 50-50 for us between utility TPA and c and S segment. Between? Between, it will, see, there are two different types of mix. <laughs> One is the who is, what is the client type? Is it utility TPA, which is coming to the bidding route, or it Correct. is coming to the route? That is one way we look at it. That is going to be, continue to be 50 50 in our opinion. As okay. of today, this 3 gigawatt has that ratio, and then moving ahead also will continue to have that ratio. Second one is the, the ratio is that EPC versus non EPC. Right. One. Mm. Uh, today, uh, the current order book, what we have is 72% is EPC and 28% is non EPC. Uh, sorry, 72%, 28% is EPC. 72% is non-EPC. Okay. Uh, moving ahead with the model, what I told you with uh, the code development, things like that, the EPC percentage would increase for us mm. because we would be developing the land along with uh, the uh, the customers in advance. 
So we expect that, okay, right now, if it is at, let's say, 70 30 ratio, 70 being non EPC, slowly it will go to 60 40, go to 50 50 in the coming years. So that's that's what would shift in terms of this. One is a customer, which customer segment is coming in, and the second Correct. one, what is the type of uh, the orders, whether EPC or the non EPC. These are the only two things which make difference uh, to us. Other one, is, other one is a model. Obviously, right now we're selling both the models of 2 megawatt and 3 megawatt. So, so right today, we have a ratio of 75-25 in our order book. 75% is 3 megawatt and 25% is 2 megawatt. Mm -hmm. Moving ahead, 3 megawatt will further increase. And then maybe then we will, by the time we'll get the next model. So that model will keep changing depending upon when the model comes into the market. That will be the third variable, which model we're selling more. On the which of the last two changes, be it in EPC, non-EPC, or 2 megawatt to 3 megawatt, will be margin accretive and cash accretive? So uh, the way we look at it, uh, you know, of course, of the total 3 gigawatt order book, uh, which we have to execute over the next uh, uh, two years, uh, essentially our average uh, selling price is close to about uh, 6 crores per megawatt. Uh, you know, that is our uh, ASP. I mean, we don't give a split between uh, manufacturing EPC and non-EPC as yet. Uh, so, you know, of course, and there is a healthy pipeline of uh, further orders that we are uh, in the process of negotiating. And, uh, you know, we'll report that to the street as and when those get confirmed, uh, get con converted into confirmed orders. Uh, so, you know, the way you should, uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, uh, look at it, uh, the, the the sort of seven odd, uh, 700 odd crores of uh, uh, EBITDA that we have uh, in the O&M business today. Uh, that is pretty much uh, free cash available uh, uh, to the business uh, straight away. Uh, now, on the manufacturing side of the business, uh, you know, depending on uh, what volumes we are able to do for FI25 and FI26, uh, and, you know, based on the economics that I took, walked you through about 10 minutes back, uh, uh, wherein you know anything over and above the 600 megawatts uh, would flow through to, to the EBITDA uh, on the manufacturing side, uh, that would sort of get added uh, to the free cash. So the O&M business free cash plus the manufacturing would be the consolidated free cash available. Uh, in terms of capex, uh, historically, you know the company has incurred about uh, 100 crores of uh, capex a year, uh, which is largely about uh, uh, sustain uh, sustenance capex. Uh, but going forward, uh, you know, to augment uh, uh, the blade capacity and also, uh, you know, plan far ahead, uh, uh, we are being, uh, you know, cautious. Uh, but at the same time, we're uh, uh, looking at capex of close to four to five hundred crores uh, uh, every year, at least for the next, uh, I would say, two to three years. Uh, and all of that capex program will be funded from the internal free cash flow of the company that would be available from the O&M plus the uh, manufacturing business division. But you still uh, need to, when you have this capacity uh, at three and a half gigawatt annually for blade as well as for the other two nozzle and this thing, you still need to put uh, starting 25 or four to 500 crore kind of for CapEx or there will be free cash uh, for shareholders. Right. It depends. The capex uh, we look at is one is the capacity. So, and I said the capacity is in models two megawatt and three megawatt. Okay, now three megawatt we're ramping up because two megawatt offtake would come down. So therefore there would be capex. So there will be decommissioning of two megawatt blades and then three megawatts coming. So there will be an additional capex. Let's say that tomorrow we get a new model. Obviously we will get a new model. So there again that additional capex will come in. So that capex, as Iman is saying, is always will be there because the new models keep coming. And world, world model sales keep going away. So that's that's the reason where you have a capex and which you keep amortizing from year to year. And uh, also, uh, Amisha, this uh, number that I gave includes the 100 crores of sustenance capex. So therefore, the Correct. incremental capex is, you know, whilst it is there, it is not only on the manufacturing side, uh, also for us, uh, uh, FI25, a large, a large amount of focus is on the uh, uh, systems, processes, automation, um, you know, of the entire institution, uh, you know, so you must appreciate that over the last uh, decade or so, as you uh, rightly said, uh, while the company has been grappling with liability management issues, a lot of these discretionary expenses, you know, like is logical, uh, you know, gets targeted first. Uh, so as a result of which, there's a huge requirement in terms of uh, 
uh, you know, upgrade of our uh, servers, uh, hardware, uh, investing in uh, SAP, etc. Uh, so we've also, you know, engaged KPMG, who's working with us very closely uh, as implementation partner to automate these systems and processes. So there will be these, you know, one-time uh, uh, capex requirements uh, to sort of augment the entire system and process to make it a completely process-driven organization. Uh, and an institution not dependent on, you know, particular individuals. Plus also what's happening is that we also need to keep in mind the, what is happening in the competition. And uh, today the, the larger volumes, then obviously the new models keep coming in uh, these things. So therefore you're always spending on your R&D and development of new models much faster. So, so you know, there, there would be CapEx with respect to that. Any new model need to design, then obviously develop a prototype and test the prototype, get it commissioned. So that's that's a long cycle process. So even those things would happen. Till now the capacities were very less. So therefore, in fact, we have not changed our platform of two megawatts for the last ten years. In the two itself, we only changed our rotor diameter. You know, we had the eighty-eight meter rotor diameter, then ninety, then one hundred eleven, then one twenty. But platform remained two megawatt. Now we move to three megawatts. So then again, here we will stabilize for some time. Then the next model will come in. So to be in the market, in the current situation where there are plenty of OEMs trying to enter into India, so you also need to see mm -hmm. that, you know, you don't lose your age in terms of technology. True. Because, because the market is huge, you also need to play in terms of your R&D and your readiness, your models with respect to the market. The market is small, then you, your approach would be different. Correct. Correct. Uh, I would now like uh, first, I mean, take the questions. questions from the participants. Yes. Uh, so that. So uh, I request uh, anyone who. You can pick the ask, important uh, questions because they've yes. already put their questions yes. into QNM. So I request anyone who wants to ask a question uh, to raise hand or put questions in the chat box. I have one question from Arijit Datta. Uh, you are unmuted, Arijit. You can go ahead with the question. I, uh, thank you, sir, for the uh, uh, wonderful session. Uh, sir, I have two questions. The first one is uh, our competitors are starting with 4 gigawatt uh, models. Uh, where are we in it? Are we in the developing stage and some guidance that when we can come up with a 4 gigawatt model? Yes. Uh, I don't know whether you uh, read the recent article in Bloomberg. Uh, which after great research, they said that bigger doesn't mean better. Okay, based on experience internationally. So they how people uh, lost getting of, going in for the bigger abides. Yeah. <laughs> Having said that, uh, what is most important for us when we look at is that uh, how do we keep optimizing the cost per kilowatt hour is very important than the size of the turbine. Uh, Sorry, there's some... Arijit, uh, can you put yourself on mute, please? There's some I'm background. Searching the... Yeah. So the uh, so therefore that that's uh, the uh, cost per kilowatt hour becomes an important second uh, factor we need to keep in mind is that the Indian wind regime is different from globally. Okay? We have a low wind regime <laughs> elsewhere. So the what is five megawatt, six megawatt, uh, four megawatt turbines which are successful outside need not be successful in India. Uh, what we do is that the one one difference between us and others is that uh, uh, we. We have a dedicated R&D for Indian market only because we are only the Indian player. So though our R&D sits in Europe, Indian market. So therefore we design for India, whereas others, what they do is they design for the global and then modify that for India. Okay. There's, there's a big difference between the two. So the we will definitely come with uh, the size what you're talking about, but at the right time, and we are already on the job on that. And uh, when the market demands that, uh, we will come back. Not only that, we are also working on, as we move ahead, the tides quality in terms of the wind speeds going to change. So because all the good high wind speed sites would keep getting exhausted, you also, though you have a huge capacity, but you will get into the sites where the wind speeds are lower. So therefore, your turbine design also is not just the megawatt size, you also need to take care of the lower wind speeds. So we are working for that variable as well. We are already getting ready for capitalizing on the next set of sites which will be available in India, which will be the low wind sites. So uh, be rest assured that the, on the R&D is one thing which we always treat as our strength because even when we did that cost cutting and everything, R&D is one thing we didn't touch one single head. 
So, because that's what has been the our founder chairman, Mr. Tulsitanti's view, always saying that, you know, uh, green mm -hmm. business is an engineered product. Technology is most important. So, they never ever compromise on technology. So, very well summarized. Uh, sir, uh, on your comment only, my second question was that on a 4 gigawatt capacity or say even on a 3 gigawatt capacity, See, uh, since our connectivity, the road connectivity, the last mile connectivity is uh, not that great in India. And sometimes we see we have to go uh, uh, from many fields where if the crane gets stuck, it, I mean, every day we will incur almost in lakhs of cost overrun. So even for a three gigawatt capacity, what are the constraints? You mentioned in the initial comment that uh, the infra uh, problem is getting sorted day by day. Uh, but if you can elaborate on this part that what is the main struggle and what is the main cause of worry and how the last mile connectivity will be uh, better with 3 gigawatt, 4 gigawatt, uh, the plate sizes. I see one you. is the, uh, the manufacturing capacity, second is the turbine size. The, as the turbine size keeps going up, the point what you're saying becomes very important. Mainly this is for the blade. The rest of the things are easy, especially for us, it's much more easy because our tower is uh, not a tubular tower. It's a lattice tower. Okay? So most part of it is structures we transport and assemble at site. So that's advantage we have compared to any other uh, person. Uh, the, uh, on the on the blades, what we do is constantly, when the monster was talking about some of the capex also, is that uh, if we have a plan to come up with a larger rotor diameter next, the our blades would be blade capacity we will create closer to the sites we think are the hub. Wherever there's a three, four gigawatts of hub is where we'll create our manufacturing facility. That's how we need to reduce our infrastructure. So today, that's uh, that's the reason if you see in our case, we have a multiple blade manufacturing plants. We don't have a multiple uh, nacelle manufacturing plants, but we have multiple blade manufacturing plants. So because the blade transportation is what is the biggest hurdle and which will continue to do it. Tomorrow, let's say that, as I said, We'll get into a low wind regime and the different turbine is going to come there. So today we're already identifying which are those sites. Where do we need those manufacturing plants closer to that? That's where the blade is concerned. So this is constant evaluation. You know, it, it keeps happening regularly. Newer and newer blade plants keep coming up. Perfect, sir. My last question is uh, on the uh, crane part. Uh, although we all are increasing capacity, but at the same point of time, they you we'll see that one year down the line when the uh, execution will be picking up, uh, there will be a shortage in the crane capacity for the EPC part uh, going ahead. See, today, the way we, uh, what happened, what is happening is the crane supply market is also maturing today in the country. Uh, like, like we are looking at the market, they are also looking at uh, the wind market because for them, this is, is, a, is a big business. Uh, we're seeing that lots of these crane manufacturers today or investing much in advance, getting the larger cranes. Uh, even today, there are cranes to go up to 160 meters up height. Uh, no issue. And in fact, some of these crane manufacturers are actually diversifying into crane supply and production because yeah. so they're making this as a main business. So therefore, that segment of uh, business is maturing. But having said that, I will not completely discount your point that you know cranes would not be a hurdle. Cranes could be a hurdle, then you are the large Trailers could be a hurdle because your large capacity trailers are required for the blade transportation. But then what happens is that the your relationship with these people over the years and your advanced planning and telling them clearly saying that this is what I'm going to do in the next four quarters, quarter and quarter on a rolling basis and tying up in advance what, what actually will help you. And that's where we feel that we do have that advantage of having built relationship with these people for the last two decades, uh, working with them. Uh, this concern would remain, but so should be able to solve from quarter to quarter, year to year. But but at the same time, having said that, uh, the what was about seven, eight years back and today the crane capacity is significantly different. People who are interested in actually investing much more in crane, uh, cranes is higher because they're seeing the market growing. Obviously, they also don't want to lose the pie of the business. Thank uh, you, sir. I have yeah. one last question, but I'll come back to the queue. I believe uh, they yeah. have about more. Arijit, uh, you can come back to the queue. We have... Uh, Question from multiple participants about the exports. Uh, are we going to uh, concentrate on exports? Are we going to put capacities outside India? 
uh, what is the outlook on export and uh, uh, Sujlon uh, strategy for exports market? Right now, uh, we forgot the spelling of export, frankly. So we don't know what the export means. Right. Okay, so for me and my team, we just have a blinkers uh, to concentrate for the next uh, FI25 and maybe FI26 in India. There's so much to do it. This is a known market, the known constraints at this stage. So therefore, for us now to go and just deliver and deliver and deliver, okay, execute and execute and execute in the known market, then we will see later. But at this stage, we're not really trying to look at anything else. Sure. So there's one question uh, on uh, from a participant called Shubham. Uh, uh, if you could highlight the cost per gigawatt, including land, for putting up uh, gas-based, solar-based, and hydrogen-based uh, uh, plants and uh, uh, will that be the key metrics uh, in your uh, business? Uh, I, I left the fossil sector 10 years back. So I don't know what are the current numbers for gas based and right. coal based capacity right. because I forgot after 2030 <laughs> having worked for so long. Maybe that was on my fingertips when I was in Reliance Power. So can't right. say, but as far as wind right. is concerned, which Imanshu mentioned, the, the what is the cost per megawatt on an average basis, whether in respect of what scope it is, so you said what eight crores per megawatt? Six, six, six crores, crores per megawatt. Yeah. Six right. crores per megawatt is what is the cost for wind. Sure. I think so it is not at, the cost per it is not the cost per megawatt. What is important is cost per kilowatt hour. Right. So we are at 435. Would you like to take questions? Yeah, we uh, we can take another 10 minutes on it uh, to 445. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sir, I have actually one question if I if you allow. So uh, you highlighted uh, how the wind changed for us. And there are multiple opportunities, including CNI, green hydrogen may come, and uh, even for the utility scale uh, gigawatt. So just wanted to understand uh, 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 each uh, segment wise, uh, what could be your uh, potential gigawatt, which you're expecting in next 24, 36 months, including CNI, utility grid. And we are talking about repowering, which can come uh, in later years. So if you would like to highlight about uh, the gigawatt opportunity sizing uh, for us? Obviously, we are not, uh, uh, we are, don't give a guidance on how much uh, gigawatts we are likely to do, but that's been not been our practice. We actually want to do and then say what it is. So we can only say that today we have 3.1 gigawatts for the book, which is for 50 50 percent between CNA and utility. To be precise, 47 and 53. 47 is CNA, 53 is utility. And as Imanshu mentioned, there are a large number of orders on the table which we are negotiating now and which we will announce to the street as and when they get finalized. And we'll continue to, to book those orders. So the, the question of the market share is uh, nothing to do with order book. Market share is actually the how much you actually go and execute. As I said, that uh, we have been maintaining that even in the first nine months of this year, our market share is 30%. Uh, but this is a low volume uh, year. Okay. So like as I said, that is 26 uh, is what uh, they they done till now. Uh, the therefore the uh, market share was just thirty percent. So that's that's what is the guidance what we can provide. And uh, and as I also said that we expect that we would continue to have a, a fifty fifty market a fifty fifty division between the C and A and bid in our other books moving. And that's what we visualize as. So the that's that's the guidance what we can provide. And we're giving yes. you the manufacturing capacity. We're giving you current order book. We also said that more orders getting booked. It's a question of uh, how much uh, execution happens on the ground. Right. So I have one question from Giriraj. Uh, one clarification. Does 7-8 gigawatt guidance for FY26 includes captive in installations for the corporate conglomerates like Adani Reliance? And uh, do we have enough windy sites available beyond 10-12 gigawatt? of current pipeline uh, and when do we think uh, we start replacing the old turbine which I already asked you the repowering yeah see the uh, I really have uh, 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 no idea about how quickly and how much capacity Sadanis and Reliance are going to do it because that's a game changer so therefore uh, I won't be able to comment what are their plans and how much suddenly they're going to come into the market and, and do that our estimate is that when we talked about seven gigawatts of this thing, it's, it's generally that's the total market what is available for outside people to do it. You know, it's available for people to go ahead and bid. Uh, how much is a captive they will manufacture, they will develop is not 
part of the seven gigawatts. Actually, if Adani is doing, they're doing their own turbines and setting up their own thing, is not part, we're not saying that part of the seven gigawatts. Okay. So this seven gigawatts is what is available to the market players, is one. And uh, as far as the sites are concerned, uh, the second point, the obviously the uh, we are now seeing the Gujarat, the Tamil Nadu has come down, Karnataka has become more. And even in Karnataka moving ahead, we are going to move to the area where the lower wind is in. Like then we are going also now going to move it to Rajasthan, provided that the GAB issue is getting resolved slowly. Hopefully it will get resolved. Then the MP. So we are going to move, if not in FI25, yeah. FI26 into the low wind regime sites, start moving to the low wind regime sites. So, so the, that's that's expectation. The and what but what is happening is that with increase the hub heights, like we ourselves have now commissioned a turbine with 160 meters hub height and 144 meter water diameter. That's the tallest uh, the turbine available in the country today. With the increase the hub height and increase rotor diameters, the efficiencies of uh, in the low wind sites also will improve. So therefore, your cost per kilowatt hour may not significantly change. Okay. Because the efficiency, fine. If the same turbine is put in a high wind speed, it would be a different way. But the but the with increased hub height and increased rotor diameters, what the we are trying to do or what our market is trying to do is that let's not get into the regime where the cost per kilowatt will go up when going to low wind AC. And as far as the repowering is concerned, it's always available repowering. I don't think the government policy is saying anything the extra in that, except saying that uh, we will uh, we will give you a provision to suspend your PPA for. 24 months. Okay, then you can you can restart uh, the PPA sale to the extent of what last three years average generation wise. But then the today uh, will it happen? Repowering immediately? In our view, not. It will take significant time because today to dismantle the turbine, uh, set up a new turbine, and get connected to the STU because most of these repowering turbines are connected to the STU. Versus for somebody an option to develop a new project, new project becomes much more viable. Uh, so therefore, while repowering is an area to good to talk about, but the real needle movement would happen after a few years, not immediately now. Sure, so I have follow-up questions. Uh, a question from Arijit Datta. Uh, Arijit, go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, thanks for the uh, follow-up. Uh, sir, uh, in the last three years, we have seen wind speed was a uh, disappointing uh, one. Uh, the PLF went down, but uh, off late, we are seeing the wind speed is again moving up. Do we, uh, can we conclude that, uh, unlike the perception that uh, in, in a, uh, El Nino, uh, uh, in a La Nina month, uh, like the last three years when the rainfall were high, wind speed uh, move up, but actually it's not. In fact, in the monsoon, good monsoon period, the wind speed is uh, bad. And in the El Nino phenomena, it becomes good. Uh, something your uh, mass data uh, shows something like that. Yes, sir. Really, it's, it's, it's a, this is a much bigger issue of what uh, is the climate change, what's going to happen to the wind profiles for the not just in India, you have seen suddenly the last year even Europe had a huge problem of wind coming down, you know, generation coming down. Uh, we had in India, the 2019, the suddenly there is a dip in the wind and it took considerable time, you know, 2020, 21, 22, it improved but it never reached uh, 19 level. But this year suddenly you see a good wind coming in. I think uh, these patterns are going to be there uh, for some time. But our view is that the earlier also we felt that over a seven-year cycle, normally it is expected that over a seven-year cycle, your average generation would remain the same. So that's what it, it is. And also the predictability of wind is slightly improving now. But having said, sir, you, my guess is as good as your guess is that what is happening to the climate. Or uh, nobody is able to predict when the rains are going to come and which season is coming, what's going to be the temperatures. Uh, that, that problem would always remain. To what extent is your guess versus my guess? But it's not a significant issue at this stage. Yes, the last three years, uh, especially the FI20 and FI21, people did face problem in terms of low wind. But this year, again, the most people where we do the OMS came back and told us, please, can you post because uh, extend your preventive maintenance time schedule because the wind is blowing for a longer period of time and there's a good wind. Sir, so I have one question on 
on the 600 megawatt uh, break even which you highlighted uh, all the way from 1500 so uh, in our presentation we have been talking about vertically integrated and low cost uh, supply chain so just wanted to understand how did we achieve the 600 break even are we outsourcing and what components we are outsourcing and what is more uh, sensible for you since there is a huge demand that would you like to keep things in house or yeah. you like so to there is uh, there are multiple factors uh, on this summit one is the uh, in 2019, we took stock saying that we can't afford, so we cut the fat significantly. Okay, improved the productivity of the people, saying that you know we can't really afford to have this sort of a things. So that's one thing, and then the uh, unrelated functions, unrelated things. So therefore, we cut the fat completely. Is 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 one aspect of it. Second aspect of it is that we said that the because of the variability nature of the things, we should need to convert our business into variable way than doing that. So therefore, what we do is that if, if we have a 300 megawatt project, it's an EPC project, a large number of project team would be hired for that project. Okay. They complete the project. If I have another project, they go there. So they, they are actually getting into the variable cost rather than getting into the fixed cost. So we moved the both in projects, manufacturing in everywhere to a variable level because we don't mind having incurring the cost when there's a demand when we're actually performing it. So we don't want to carry that cost when we are not, when we don't have a demand. So therefore we also switched over from a fixed cost concept to variable concept without impacting our, so you always have your core people, but that you can't avoid. If you have a project of three megawatt, 300 megawatts, there is, an, let's say that X amount of core people, which you are trained and you're there, they are your people, there you're carrying them from long time. But the rest of the people is what you hire for the project. And normally, because you are doing a multiple projects at different points of time, so though they're variable, but they can move from project to project. But by any chance, if I don't have a project, it would go away. So a lot of uh, manpower cost and OPEX cost. So we actually move to the variable level, depending upon the performance rather than actually just carrying the cost. So these two factors is what made us, uh, you know, to reduce our cost. So we will still incur this cost if there is a demand, but that will be demand related one which comes in the variable cost when when once you talked about gross margin these things are taken care of there before the gross margin sure so i'll take the last question then hand it over to uh mrs Sora. so last questions are on uh uh, uh on the uh oms side which has been a cash cow and contributing 35 percent if you would like to highlight the uh, uh, contribution about opportunity sizing in that space over the next two, three years? And uh, what is the per megawatt OMS required or uh, if any metrics is there? You're talking about the financial numbers? Or talking uh, about the, the, the service, you... yeah. yeah. So the uh, costing per megawatt, how, how it is and what is the opportunity for uh, ONM? Uh, like you like want to explain sometime back, see that money that every turbine we sell would have a service contract. That's mandatory for us. Otherwise, we don't sell out a bank. Okay. The only difference is that uh, whatever we commission, it comes into a commercial cycle for OMS three years after commissioning. So that means whatever we are commissioning, let's say in FI24, so FI25, 26, 27, three years, they will be in the free OMS. In FI28, they will come into the revenue generation mode. So with a three-year lag, so they will keep growing. So that's, and in addition to that, the, we also today acquired about, uh, we are now trying and testing the method of doing multi-brand OMS. Now also doing OMS for other makes and just restricting to ourselves. So we've done in a bonest way because we don't want to venture into it unless we're sure we can do it, we don't lose money. So we right now we have about 250 megawatt. If we are successful in that, that also will increase the business of multi-brand. That will be the opportunity. Sure. So thank you very much for your time. I'll hand it over to Mrs. Amisha Vora. Uh, yes. Nice to Sir, frankly, thank you so much because uh, that's what I was understanding that A, while the industry dynamics itself has changed and made this cost very affordable and also the, uh, you know, very uh, positive from the perspective of environment, Internally also you all have done enough to make sure that you really participate in this entire growth. 
and uh, thank you so much for your time. The stock has done very well, but it still tells me that uh, from here on also, it should do very well because your ONM pie is a nice cash cow and it is continuously growing and will continue to grow. While uh, the other business where there is a big opportunity, you are still right now servicing only the India opportunity and you are full. That means over three years, more opportunities can also open globally. And I wish you all very best. And I'm sure in your able hands, the company will do very well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank I would you. like to thank all the participants also. We saw more than 200 participants participating. And uh, really thankful, sir, for your time, uh, Mr. Modi and Mr. Charasani. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you so very much.